It's really a great pleasure to introduce our, our lead speaker this morning, Dr. Robert K. Ross. We call him Bob. Um, Bob is the president and CEO of the California Endowment. It's a position that he has held since the fall of 2000. In that role, he has drawn upon his rich experiences in philanthropy, the public sector, as well as being a cl clinician um, working to improve access to health care for all Californians, especially those that have been left behind. He is a philanthropic leader who is not afraid to take risk, all the more so if they may lead to a better, more just society, as demonstrated by one example, the endowments um, work pushing, implementing uh, the Affordable Care Act. And of course, he has led the California Endowment foray into focusing on place, their work in 14 communities across the state, and the linkages to public policy for transformative change. He often refers to this work as connecting the grassroots to the treetops. So please join me in welcoming Bob Ross. Uh, good morning. Uh, for those of you who have traveled uh, to be here, you've, you get a sense of what it's like living in California these days. We either have drought or flooding, nothing in between. Um, so welcome and uh, thank you, Elwood. Uh, thank you, Jim Ferris, uh, for organizing this, uh, this conversation. Um, thank all of you who, who travel to be here in particular, uh, whether it was from uh, uh, points distant and across the country or down the 405 freeway. Um, this is a, um, an interesting moment for us, uh, at least at, at our foundation, to, to talk about what's happened. It's probably the first opportunity um, I've had after about a year and a half of planning and then four years into the implementation phase of our 10-year strategy. Um, it's, it's the first time I've had an opportunity to try and organize um, my thoughts and our thoughts about um, our journey um, to an audience uh, that's bigger than a boardroom. So uh, it, it took me, I struggled a bit to try and capture uh, six years of, um, of journey in, um, uh, in about 25 minutes, but so you'll have to, you'll have to bear with me. You're my, you're my test audience um, in terms of, of conveying what I think uh, we've learned and, and, and what's happened. Um, so whether you know it or not, uh, those of you that are involved with, with um, place work, and there's a number of people in this audience or connected to this audience that we learned a whole lot from and continue to learn a lot from in terms of what we've done with place. Um, so you're Trekkies, right? And uh, uh, remember, remember the, um, the opening uh, stanza from the, from the old uh, Star Trek television series. Um, so I, we've replaced that with place the final frontier, right? Uh, and so, I, you know, what I'm going to do, I'm gonna, it's going to be a little bit like, like a, um, at least certainly parts of it, uh, uh, drinking uh, uh, water from a fire hose, because uh, I'm going to throw a lot at you uh, in a relatively short um, period of time. Um, but I'm really, what I'm trying to do is just share with you uh, what we've seen uh, and learned uh, in our journey. Um, uh, back to the space analogy, there are wormholes and black holes, uh, Klingon vessels, fort photon torpedoes. Um, that's what the work of, of place um, is about. It is, it is uh, both exhilarating and, and messy. Um, I would not trade the last uh, five years uh, for any other five-year professional period in my career. Um, it has been that exciting um, and that insightful, and I've learned more um, in the last five years than I have in the previous 35 years uh, in my professional career. And so uh, I'm going to try and give you... Um, uh, this is a, a, it's a 10-year, uh, $1 billion commitment for us. Uh, as far as we know, the largest uh, place-based domestic effort in, in the uh, at least foundation-funded uh, effort um, in the country that, that we're aware of. Um, we decided, you know, go big or go home. Um, but there's a lot of folks that we learned from along the way. 
um, Skillman Foundation, um, any Casey Foundation, the Aspen Institute, Northwest Area Foundation, uh, Humboldt Area Foundation, um, Dudley Street, the Harlem Children's Zone, Market Creek in San Diego. Uh, we're pretty voracious about connecting with people who have been in this place and in this space and trying to figure out uh, how to do this uh, well and thoughtfully and how to do it uh, right. And, and, I'll, and I promise you I'll answer the question, why did we pick 14 sites? Uh, by way of, of context, um, how, how I got into this uh, work, this is my, my third career, my first career as a pediatrician, my second career in, in public health, and in my third career here in philanthropy. And the, the burning bush uh, for me was the crack cocaine epidemic. Because in, in the mid-1980s, um, I was practicing as a community pediatrician in Camden, New Jersey, and between 1984 and, and 1986, uh, those of you that were doing uh, any work, anything, anything near community at that time, remember what happened to, uh, in particular, urban America uh, during, those, that, during that period of time. And when, the, when some um, evil genius in, invented crack, and the price point, the affordability point for cocaine went from $100 and up down to $5, it changed the world. Uh, for many of those communities. Um, it was the most uh, brilliant and evil form of disruptive innovation um, that we've seen. And uh, how it influenced or shaped my world uh, of, of pediatric practice uh, were skyrocketing increases in family violence, in child abuse, in infant mortality, in sexually transmitted diseases, in HIV AIDS, in youth homicides, in school dropout rates, uh, the, the, the public health the public health status of communities like Camden and Detroit and New York and Philly and St. Louis and South Los Angeles and Oakland and Richmond just went through the roof. Okay? And this was a, a national phenomenon. Uh, the second thing it did was uh, it, it, it ushered in a national uh, federal policy response. We all know what that response was. Uh, the nation decided to criminalize sick people. Um, the red ribbon to the incarceration superhighway was cut, uh, gave us three strikes and you're out, gave us a culture of zero tolerance, and 35 years later, we're still trying to undo it. And so you have to understand that as, as, a, as, a, as a practicing pediatrician trained at the best Ivy League um, institutions, uh, preparing for myself for my career, uh, I was being introduced quite rudely uh, to what we in public health call the social determinants of health. Right? That poverty uh, has an extraordinary impact on, on health and health status, and, and I was getting a, a, a clinical introduction uh, to the notion of uh, lethal absences of hope. And it just led me to think differently about healing um, and health uh, and health care and health status and decided ultimately to go into a career in, in public health, which ultimately led me to um, uh, the, the position I have now at the California Endowment. And so that was, you know, for, for each one of us, uh, our experiences, you, we can't divorce ourselves from the experiences that we have. Uh, and that experience uh, for me, to this day, um, stays with me in terms of uh, the role of place in health. We now know that uh, one of the single best predictors of one's health status is your zip code. Um, your zip code means much more than your genetic code in terms of predicting um, health status. And the data is very, very clear on that. So, we got to the, I got to the foundation uh, shortly after 2000. Um, we, as a health foundation, we were focusing on a number of what I would call garden variety um, uh, community health investments. Uh, a lot of them were on the care and delivery side of the equation. Uh, we began to experiment uh, in those years, in some of those early years, with uh, community health in a more upstream social determinants uh, kind of lens. 
We had a childhood obesity program uh, that we funded. We had a children's mental health program we supported. Uh, we did a children's health coverage program. Um, we did um, California Works for Better Health, which was around the, the nexus of, of economic um, opportunity and health. Each of those initiatives uh, were kind of siloed within the foundation, maybe a three to five year initiative. Uh, but for the first time, we were beginning to experiment with sites underneath this umbrella initiative. So, so the Childhood Obesity uh, Initiative was maybe six sites. The Children's Health Coverage Initiative st actually started out as three sites and then, and then spread to about a dozen or so. And we were beginning to get an understanding of, of what it was like to work in place connected to a broader policy conversation. A couple of those uh, initiatives went really well. Um, a couple of them didn't. Uh, we learned along the way. Uh, by the time we got to uh, 2008, 2009, uh, it was time for us to get in a room with the board and talk about all that we had learned uh, in service of our mission and begin trying to apply it uh, towards a, a longer 10-year strategy. Concurrently, uh, as we're beginning to learn lessons uh, from ourselves, from our own work um, within the foundation, uh, we had the Harlem Children's Zone, we had Dudley Street, we had Market uh, Creek. Um, we had a number of, of, um, of efforts around the country that we could sort of peer over the shoulder about and see what was working and perhaps what wasn't. And then the third thing that was happening was we were beginning to uh, get more comfortable with funding policy advocacy and community organizing. Not in a big way, uh, but we were beginning to, to flirt with it. And it was this, this combination, this confluence of internal learnings from, from a smaller group of place-based initiatives, uh, watching uh, place work uh, in the field, um, and and this, uh, this taste of what funding, advocacy, and community organizing could do in terms of our health mission that led us to kind of bring all that together and, 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 and that ultimately that became um, building healthy communities. Yeah. We uh, decided to, uh, well, let me get to what, why we picked uh, 14 sites because um, it's an interesting conversation. So the reason we picked 14 sites is because the board wouldn't let me do 20. <laughs> um, I'm serious about that. Uh, because at the time that we were uh, deciding on how many sites and where the sites would be and all of that methodology, uh, that's when the stock markets hit. Uh, uh, the economy tanked. Um, we, along with a whole bunch of folks, lost a bunch of money. Um, and we decided we couldn't afford to do uh, 20 sites and we landed on, on 14. Um, and the reason why we did 14, and you could imagine what we heard in the boardroom, Bob, why don't you start with two, right? And, and here's the reason why. Um, what we're doing is not, to the extent that there might be a traditional place-based philanthropic approach, and I'm not sure there is, Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Uh, you guys can figure that out later today. But to the extent that, that maybe there is a, a traditional place-based uh, approach, um, probably what you might describe what we're doing is place plus. Um, we, were, we were very clear from the outset uh, that place for us was both an outcome and a strategy. And, and the bigger prize was, was statewide policy change to allow for greater uh, uh, opportunities for young people to be healthy in distressed communities. Okay. So we were thinking about policy and scale right from the beginning. Okay. And what we weren't trying to do is to create the quintessential national model in one place for which then we could you know, get a paper out, and then everyone would rush to replicate it, right? Which doesn't happen, right? Um, you know, it's, it's also interesting, uh, and, and, and I've been a, a, I mean, Jeff Canada is nothing less than a hero um, to me. 
But just for a minute, I just want you to, to think about uh, the Harlem Children's Zone as an example and scale, right? Because probably in the last 40 years of, of, um, of nonprofit work, there may not be a more celebrated uh, effort than the Harlem Children's Zone. Oprah, New York Times, 60 Minutes, Time Magazine, the White House, um, and, and I think all of that, quite frankly, deserve it. And uh, recall when President Obama was uh, putting together his, um, his first administration sort of agenda, and, and it was even in some of his campaign speeches when he ran for president the first time, the Harlem Children's Zone as a, as a potential national model for, for addressing child, uh, childhood poverty. Um, so it, 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 it forced me, and I, I just want you to, to, to just think about this for a minute. <clears throat> if, if you can't get to scale <laughs> with serious love from the President of the United States, Oprah, and the New York Times, we gotta think about what it takes to get to scale. Okay? Um, and so I think the President and the White House had designs for a billion dollar plus package to, to try and move the Harlem Children's Zone into a replication model, uh, which is the cost of one B-1 bomber, by the way. The cost of one B-1 bomber is a billion dollars. And the President of the United States could not get that. So I, I just, I just want you to just kind of sit on that for a minute, okay? Because, because when, you, when you think about that, it's really disruptive to those of us in the, in the world of philanthropy to, to think about how you get, how one gets to scale, right? And typically, the paths are lined with either data and research. That is, if we just pile up enough evidence and data and research that shows that something works, then little elves will take it to scale, right, magically. <clears throat> or the other altar that we worship as is the altar of innovation, right? It's the new idea. Right? And, and both are fraught with serious problems in terms of assuming that that's how one gets to scale. I would say to you that innovation is obviously important and necessary. I would say to you that data and evidence, important and necessary, those two are wholly and decidedly insufficient, right? And the piece that's missing is power. Okay. And so, you know, we, we, can, we can actually spend a lot of time just on, on that issue. I'm gonna get back to, to, to our story, but the reason I'm telling you that is because we were incorporating these sort of lessons and observations into, and that's why we did 14 sites. We weren't trying to do one perfect site and get it right and then assume that the rest of the nation would follow, right? We decided we wanted to go to as many sites as we could afford to be thoughtful about and connect those leaders across sites through the lived experiences of people living in those distressed neighborhoods and communities, not Malibu and Brentwood, but the Iron Triangle in Richmond, in Fresno, in South Central Los Angeles, in Boyle Heights, in Salinas, in Coachella, and amplify the voices of their experience to influence the policy debate and the policy discourse around children and their health. Right? That's, that's why we went to place. Okay? So I, I, I need to kind of get that out there. It's, it's to the extent that that may not be a traditional uh, place model, um, that, that's fine, and, and we can have, I'm sure, uh, plenty of time for, for debate and conversation uh, around that approach. Um, let me get to uh, uh, the early years, a couple of years um, in the work. Um, we, we chose 14 sites. Uh, one of the, uh, the bumpy areas we had is a couple of them that we had. Um, one was, and we learned this from a number of other funders um, around the country, and it's the tension between community-driven and community-led and community-engaged, right? So if you're gonna go into a place and you, and you really mean for the community to have full, decisive authority about what the priorities are going to be and the work is going to be, then do that, but you better mean it. 
if you say that and you actually have this other agenda that's, you know, in our case, we're a health foundation. We really had to be about health. You better say that. You better be clear about what your expectations are. And so to the extent that, that people might call what we're doing a community-led initiative, I would rather use the term community engaged. Okay? Because we're a health foundation. We had a health mission. And so when we descended into these communities, at the height of the fiscal crisis, and we wanted to talk about childhood obesity, and they wanted to talk about jobs and foreclosures, that's a problem, okay? And so that was really a trust building moment for us in the planning phase, uh, because we want to talk about childhood obesity and, and, and children's health coverage. Aren't those issues important to you? But yeah, but you know, I just got laid off. What are you gonna do about that? And so what, what it did was uh, it, it forced us to be clear about a certain set of results that we were seeking. We had sort of these big four results that we said, okay, these are the kinds of results that we're seeking and can we have a, a community uh, conversation in these sites about how to get there. So we wanted to be clear that there was a set of results, although the, the, the strategies for how to get there would come um, in a community engaged process. Uh, but I have to just say that planning period, that 12 to 15 month planning period, it wasn't pretty. Um, it, it, was, uh, it, it was bumpy, um, it was rocky, we threw logic models at them. Um, that didn't go well. Um, you know, we talked about our big four results, they were like, you know, where did that come from? Um, but I, I, and I don't have any wisdom to, to uh, provide you on that front except um, humility and staying at it, um, and candor. Mm -hmm. And I think it was, it was that, that we, we tried to do the best we could about being um, clear about what we, what we were uh, trying to achieve, um, as well as um, um, focusing on, on, a, on a set of results that we all could um, agree upon. Um, let me, um, let me say one other thing about the, the, the planning phase. Uh, we were at an Aspen Institute uh, community roundtable, um, and, and there was a session that Ann Kubish helped design because we were, at that point we were in the planning stages and we wanted to get to hear from the Aspen um, community roundtable about from folks around the table, any Casey Foundation, many others. Um, and it was one thing that, that um, Frank Farrell, and I'm not sure whether Frank is here, are you here, Frank? So Frank Farrow uh, said something to me in the middle of this, this back and forth. Uh, they, they were kicking the tires on our, on our, on our uh, planning work for, for VHC. And Frank said, uh, you know, Bob, there's, there's one thing uh, you need to, to keep in mind, be, because those of us in the field of, you know, the, the, the do-gooders, well-intended types in the field of philanthropy, we talk a lot about transforming community and transforming neighborhoods. Um, but don't underestimate how much foundations may need to transform themselves first just to do this kind of work. And that, that stuck with me. I mean, I, I knew we would have to make some changes, um, but uh, it, it, it forced me as CEO to, to kind of go to a blank slate for a minute, um, if, rather than sort of from where we were. Uh, we ultimately significantly restructured the organization. Uh, we ended up in a painful period of time laying off about 40% of our staff. Um, the leadership team is almost completely uh, um, overhauled um, since then. Uh, we have a place team and a policy team, um, and that's how we continue to be structured today. The place team is called uh, um, Healthy Communities, and the policy team is called Healthy California. Um, at the time, um, and I was uh, warned by folks like, like Betty King and Marion Standish and others, uh, Bob, you're not thinking enough about the integration between place and policy. And, I, and quite frankly, I just couldn't figure out how to structure that. Um, and, and it was one of those things that said, okay, we'll learn it, on, we'll learn it in, in the flight path. But let's, let's just, you know, you, you spend time thinking and planning and at some point you gotta just like break the huddle and run the damn play and see what happens, right? So we broke the huddle and, and we moved. And now we know more about the integration uh, piece than, um, than we did before. Um, and happy to talk about that and if we have time for question and answers um, later. Um, the other thing we did was, in the early years, guided by what we heard from colleagues, uh, we made sure to design uh, some dollars that would go to the sites um, for early wins. Okay. 
early tangible wins. Um, all of us who've been in this work, um, the conversations that need to happen uh, can be lengthy, um, and, and you, could, you can get into two years, three years, four years, and work like this, and, and, and the criticism is a lot of meetings and nothing has happened, right? So we designed the, the early years in, in the sites uh, to make sure that, um, um, and these are community identified early wins. So something as mundane as, as a soccer field that needed to be refurbished, um, as a local YMCA that needed an after school program that didn't have one before, um, a project in Salinas, which was a refurbishment of, of the uh, Cesar Chavez Library so that kids would have a place to go to after school. You know, that kind of, of stuff, just to, just to you know, build momentum as we're building trust uh, and building strategies um, for the long haul. So um, that's how we, we, we got going. Uh, in the early years, um, uh, we got a lot of phone calls. I got phone calls um, from mayors, from city council people, from a couple of uh, 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 members of boards of supervisors. Um, why don't you just give us the money? You're not, I mean, in so many words, you don't really trust those people to advise you on how to use that money, do you? Um, in a number of cases, uh, phone calls from um, annoyed, irritated uh, mayors or city council folks um, who said, these people you're funding are making my life uncomfortable. I can't get my general plan done. I can't get my economic strategy, my downtown renovation thing, whether it's in, in, um, uh, in Santa Ana or other communities where, you know, where economic development slash really gentrification strategies um, were underway and the communities didn't like what was going on. And that was a litmus test for us um, to, you know, to take a phone call from a mayor and say, thank you for sharing, but, you know, the community has, has identified these priorities and we're going to, you know, stick with them, but we'd like to keep the, you know, the relationship um, um, going. And so that was, when those phone calls were coming in, actually that was the first, none of that was in our evaluation strategy, but those phone calls, are a reflection of communities exercising muscularity and power, right? Um, so those are the early years. Let me, um, let me get into um, some lessons thus far. We're now at year four of 10. Um, and uh, <clears throat> We've had three evaluations, um, independent evaluations, one of them uh, from Manuel Pastor, who's, who's over here at, here at USC, another from the Foundation Strategy Group, and a third from uh, the Center for Responsive Philanthropy. Um, they're all on our website. Um, uh, rich um, feedback, uh, not all of it pretty, uh, but generally uh, adding up to, um, you got progress here, there's something here, uh, there's something happening here, I think is the name is, was the name of uh, Manuel's, um, uh, evaluation. Uh, much work to do, um, particularly around issues of uh, what we've heard from voices from the field, um, about issues of alignment and expectations and communication between philanthropy and, and, um, and, and grantees and, and grassroots leaders. Uh, so a bunch of work to do there, but, but, but good progress um, to be had. Um, here are five things we've learned on the flight path, um, things that we do differently that we never did before. Okay, as a result of, of this engagement. Uh, one is we're funding uh, community and youth advocacy and organizing hand over fist. Um, we're expecting to do some of that. Um, it is even uh, lifted up to a greater degree than we thought before, and that's because we've seen results from that, and I'll show you a sizzle reel about that in a second. Um, secondly, we changed the goals. Those big four results are, are now uh, three campaign goals. Um, the bottom line of why we changed the, the, um, the results framework is because communities said we are not problems to be solved. Um, we are not just about brokenness. Uh, we have ideas for changing our community and changing the world, right? And so we went from a, a disease orientation in the results, such as the reduction of childhood obesity, the reduction of youth violence, to a health happens here frame Health happens in neighborhoods, health happens with prevention, health happens with schools. Okay, so the, frame, the, the, the results framework is now underneath uh, that umbrella and that more positively um, asset-oriented um, framework. Thirdly, we, we embarked uh, on impact investing, which we weren't doing before. 
Um, so we now do uh, uh, more PRIs. Uh, we now have a mission investing strategy. Uh, we unleash a program called Freshworks uh, because you can go into a community and lecture parents about their kids being too fat. Uh, but what they're really saying is, well, give us opportunities to eat healthier and we can, we can do better by our families, right? So we funded a Freshworks program in Elwood Hopkins and, and Tina Castro, where's Tina at? Uh, if you want to hear more about, about that strategy, um, talk to them. They helped uh, help us walk our hands. And so now we have fresh food markets in these communities and in sites, and a number of them that we didn't have before. Uh, we also went and embarked on an MRI strategy. Um, and our first foray into that, uh, which was pretty aggressive, uh, basically flopped. Didn't work. Um, so we've taken that back in the tool shed uh, and retooling that. Fourthly, we do criminal justice and boys and men of color and race work um, in ways that we didn't anticipate and didn't anticipate before. Uh, we're part of the president's uh, 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 My Brother's Keeper sort of national campaign around boys and men of color. We do criminal justice work because communities are furious, simmering boil about the incarceration superhighway and the school to prison pipeline. It is the stuff of Ferguson, it is the stuff of Trayvon Martin, and it is in these communities. And it is that as an example as to why I don't think you, you, you can, if you're an education funder, uh, throw an innovative teacher training curriculum um, at an inner city school and expect um, lasting meaningful change, okay? These communities are not test tubes. I know we come from test tube environments and some siloed environments, but that is not their life. Yeah. And so uh, issues of, of race and justice and injustice and oppression uh, just come forward and it comes, and you better be prepared to hear it and deal with it even if you can't fix it, right? And then lastly, um, on evaluation. Um, we're still, we're, we're five, four years in, we're still figuring out evaluation on this, and thank God we didn't try to get it perfect before we started or we would still be planning, right? Um, so we do have an evaluation framework that we're more comfortable with. I will say to you one thing that we realized that we didn't realize before was storytelling. Storytelling is powerful. Okay? And storytelling can be part of evaluation. If anything, um, I now have a new view about data and research on, 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 on results. And that is, uh, you should get enough data to be able to tell yourself a good story. Okay? Because the way to the hearts and minds of public policymakers is no numbers without stories and no stories without numbers, and you better have some people behind those stories. Okay? And so uh, with that, let me, let me run these sizzle reels. Um, I'll wrap up with a couple of other, a couple of comments. I'm gonna show you two, two reels. Um, what we learned about storytelling, we learned enough that we actually now employ somebody at the California Endowment full time who does nothing but take uh, video and digital content about organizing and power and advocacy in these sites and how folks are coming together. That's all she does. That's her full time job. Okay? And so I'm gonna show you two of the reels that we have. I think each one is maybe about three minutes. 60% of those who were eligible but uninsured were Latinos. So the numbers told us, here's where you need to go. <laughs> Cerca de un millón y medio de indocumentados en California vive actualmente sin un seguro médico. We strategically created the campaign as a hashtag. We wanted to have a diverse set of voices talking about this issue, community-based organizations. Servicio médico para todos. In all of the work that you see for the Health for All campaign, the youth really stand out. The Sigmunds doesn't look at you and tells you, because you're undocumented, you can't get sick. A lot of creative media efforts. I ain't gonna stop until we have coverage for these people that work in our industry. We brought together a producer from the Grey's Anatomy show with real people who shared their stories. Ooh. What? She's not pregnant. Looks like a mass, and there's free fluid. A mass the size of a soccer ball. No, no, you can't do that. You don't understand. We have no papers, undocumented. And they are going to help you. A noisy rally was held outside Fresno's Community Regional Medical Center by a group who wants Fresno County to make sure the undocumented poor continue to get the medical treatment they need. I would like the Board of Supervisors help us to stay healthy. 
undocumented immigrants may not lose access to specialty health care in Fresno County after all. We gotta set aside racial colors, standards, and view each other as brothers, humans, because that's what we, we really are. I got suspended the first week of eighth grade. I got suspended for making a, a video with my friends. It was just like there could have been so many things to prevent me being out of school. We need to see something done now. What? Now started out with a focus on schools. As we presented it to the community, one of the things that really resonated for them was how relevant the information was to community members who are, you know, dealing day to day with under-resourced schools and under-resourced communities. Since 1980, California has built 22 new prisons, but just one new university. Does this add up for California? Social media—that's where the comparisons really came to life. The hashtag, do the math, and student prisons was really used well by our young people to increase the conversation amongst their peers. And for our radio ads, we decided to turn to our young people. Too bad nobody asks us how to spend that money. I'd hire more counselors. Think of what else we could do with that money to help kids have a successful and healthy life. <laughs> Send 15 kids to preschool, which lessens their chances of going to prison by 28%. Send two students to UCLA. I grew up, I'm gonna go to UCLA Medical School and be a heart surgeon. It was the right message at the right time, resonated with our communities and beyond. Education is the key to our dreams and a good life. Let's invest in schools, not prisons. Do the math. Let's do it together. We are more schools, less prison. We get it. More schools, less prison, California. <laughs> They'll never be able to stop us. Okay, I think there's another real, but in the interest of the time, I'm not going to show that one. But, but you know, when you get Jay Z, <laughs> right? So let, let me just say, I know I'm way over time. Uh, let, let me just, a, a couple of, um, of lessons uh, for colleagues um, out there about, about the wonderful work of place. Um, I, I, I guess I would call this the, uh, the um, five top reasons to do place. Uh, one is it, it really does force us out of our silos. And as a health foundation, it really forces us out of our silo uh, in terms of looking at health from the standpoint of health care or even just health prevention. Um, secondly, it really promotes a very necessary familiarity about injustice and oppression. Uh, it is impossible to work in place uh, and, and dodge and duck issues of racism and race, poverty, systemic, systematic oppression of marginalized groups and communities. Um, as funders, we can choose to ignore or minimize the relevance of these issues, but we do so at our peril. Even if you happen to get some results, they will not stick. Uh, thirdly, it highlights the matter of trust. The track record of philanthropic initiatives in place seems to share a common theme. If the trust building factor is high, the results are good. If it's lousy, trouble will abound. Um, trust building with community leaders in place requires our institutions to behave with candor, transparency, humility, and clarity. All of them are needed attributes in our field. Fourthly, it requires the recognition of assets, um, assets in community, but also assets um, at our own foundation. Um, if the 12 to 15 month planning process in building healthy communities taught us anything, it was the following. That community leaders and young people expressed that we are not problems for you to solve. We have strength, we have passion, we have ideas, we have energy to better this world. The communities may be distressed, but the people are not broken. And there's no better capstone uh, uh, about our, our democracy and the promise of our democracy than that, than that adage. And then finally, the power of the undiscovered idea. So in the research and planning phase of BHC, we, we, we spent some money um, with some folks, and Peter Pennekamp was on our board, remembers this. And you, know, you, do, the, you do the high-priced um, environmental scan. Um, and uh, we thought we saw, saw and heard everything that might be um, out there. Um, but in the video clip, you, you heard some of these young people talking about school discipline and suspensions. Uh, that issue was nowhere on our radar screen as we started the BHC process. And it wasn't until we took our board to a site visit in Fresno 
and the young people, a youth group there in Fresno, uh, presented to our board and said, um, our kids are getting kicked out of school, it's the front door to the prison pipeline, and we need you to do something about it because we see it as a health issue. And the board looked at me like, Bob, what's up with that? Um, we had no idea that that was a major issue. Uh, we realized through uh, other listening sessions that we heard the same in Richmond, in Long Beach, in LA, in Boyle Heights. Um, we decided to embark on, on being driven by their voices on the issue. Uh, what alternative practices did they recommend? Uh, restorative justice uh, was among them. Uh, we connected these young people and what you saw was some, some of the clips were young people coming together to talk about um, uh, school discipline reform. Uh, in about 18 months, five bills got to the governor's desk. Uh, I'm sorry, nine bills got to the governor's desk. He signed five of them. Uh, two years later, we now have uh, a reduction in school suspension in the state of California of 22% after 30 years of increases. Okay. So that, that, is, that is impact and results through a justice lens um, that led to a meaningful, meaningful sort of policy change. That battle's not won. Um, but that is, that is one of the ways we're going to get to begin to disrupt the school to prison pipeline um, in this state. And, and uh, that was a very strong example of, of, as the Bible says, a child shall lead them. So I just want to say it's been uh, quite a ride. Um, it's, it's been about uh, power um, and advocacy and voice um, and humility and respect and listening and learning and adjusting on the fly. Um, I will say this is wonderful, wonderful work, but ride, you know, riding a roller coaster is a lot of fun too, unless you have motion sickness, right? And, and, and if you're a philanthropic institution that will get motion sickness from doing this kind of work, then don't do it. Right? You have to be willing uh, to be an adaptive learner. You have to be willing to be a good listener. You have to be willing to be a little bit humble. You gotta be willing to do a couple of things that your institution has never been forced, to do, uh, forced or compelled um, to do before. And I'll close with um, two quotes. I think they're related. Um, Frederick Douglass, uh, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did um, and it never will. And Spock, uh, who might say, um, you need power to live long and prosper. Thank you.